Hello, and welcome to the National Archives Foundation's virtual program series. I'm Patrick Madden, the Executive Director of the National Archives Foundation. We're delighted to welcome you today from home for our program. Through this programming, we're happy to kick open the doors to the more than 15 billion records at the National Archives Foundation. So our guests today will be taking questions and we're eager to know who's watching today. So um, in the YouTube chat, I hope you'll uh, put your questions for uh, Derek Brown, our good friend. And uh, just to practice right now, why don't you jump in there and give us your hometown, your city and state, and I'll give you a shout out uh, later on in the program. And remember, you don't have to wait until the end to ask your questions. You can put your questions in at any time. And now let's get to our featured speaker, Derek Brown. He is an American entrepreneur, writer, and mixologist. He owns Vars Columbia Room, The Passenger, Mockingbird Hill, Eat the Rich and Southern Efficiency in Washington, DC. In addition to being a leader in the classic cocktail movement, he's an expert on the history and culture of spirits and drinks. Uh, Derek travels the world teaching seminars and learning about regional and local variations of spirit and drinks. His latest book, uh, Spirit, Sugar, Water, Bitters, How the Cocktail Conquered the World, got quite a bit of buzz last year. Uh, we were uh, delighted to have him for a program uh, before the shutdown. And uh, I just learned that he is pinning another book coming out early next year. He uh, serves on the board of directors of the Museum of the American Cocktail, but his real claim to fame is his role as the Chief Spirits Advisor to the National Archives Foundation. Derek, I'm getting thirsty. Are you with us? I sure am. Hello, everybody. How are you? Thank you, Patrick. Hey. I really appreciate that. I share in that friendship, and I'm grateful for you all inviting me today. Um, and when we're offline a little bit later, I noticed in that picture there's a nice watch at the National Archives. I want to learn a little bit more about that. Terrific. Um, what the discount is for Chief Spirits Advisor. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I am grateful to be here. I think that explains a lot about me. Um, I, uh, my book that's coming out in 2022, what year is it? Yeah, 2022 is uh, called Mindful Mixology. And that's gonna be all about non-alcoholic drinks. And that's a little bit about what we're talking about today. And the drink that first that I'm gonna make, uh, so you have something in front of you, uh, to drink, those of you who are playing along, those of you who are just sipping anything, enjoy. Don't worry about it. But for those who want to play along, um, this is actually going to be in the book. And, and honestly, this cocktail kind of got me very interested in pursuing the idea of temperance drinks, which we're going to get into in a little bit. But first, I want to make sure that you have whatever you need in front of you all, Patrick, too. I know eventually you're going to make this. Uh, to uh, make this drink and make it delicious. Um, I'm gonna use um, a shaker. You don't need to use a shaker. You can build it directly in the glass. And I have my We the People glass. Um, it's got uh, article one and two in there. And uh, it's, you know, the, it, it's definitely something that people should drink from and read at the same time. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to make it in the shaker. As I mentioned, this is a, this is called a, a Boston shaker. Sometimes people have a cobbler shaker that's three parts. Um, and so that will have a built-in strainer. I'm going to use the Boston shaker. It's usually what professional bartenders use. And I'm going to have a Hawthorne strainer as well, which has this handy little um, coil in it that helps to get ice shards and whatever. Let's say you're making a mojito or whatever drink might have stuff in it. Um, to strain that out. And then sometimes we also use a tea strainer as well, what we affectionately refer to as a double strainer to make sure all the ice shards are out of it. Um, I have lemon in front of me um, and I think real fresh citrus is kind of critical to this whole endeavor. That's what we've been talking about a lot. That's what classic cocktail bartenders used as well. That's what they used when they were making temperance drinks. Um, if you have the, the real plastic lemon, you're going to be okay for today, but in the future, I'll show you how to squeeze a lemon if you're not sure yet. Um, I have some lemon syrup that I've made in advance, which is basically just sugar and lemon and peels and trying to get a nice, rich flavor out of it. And something that I know that not everybody is going to have, because um, it's not like a handy ingredient you have 
like in the cabinet is acid phosphate, which also I just think sounds scary. It's like acid phosphate. That's not something that most people think of as a normal thing to ingest. And yet I guarantee that almost everybody in the audience has ingested it because it was a classic component in sodas. And soda, the cocktail is an American drink, but the soda is a real American drink. And uh, phosphoric acid is in Coca-Cola. So that was originally part of a group of sodas called phosphates. So it's not, it's not really all that weird. We've had it before. Um, and I got it from the Extinct Chemical Company. I mentioned that because you might go online and be like directed to some weird website that has wholesale vats of it for your soda making. Don't worry, go to Extinct Chemical Company. Uh, a bartender and chemist, Darcy O'Neill, has created it. It's wonderful. Um, and I have some soda water. I just use Perrier. They didn't give me any money to sponsor it, but um, it's good. All right. Um, I'm going to make it real quick, and we're going to build it all in the Boston shaker. I'm going to put it in the smaller end, which is referred to as a cheater. If anybody knows why it's called a cheater, please put that in the comments because I honestly don't know. And I got that question yesterday and I've yet to Google. Yes, that's right. Even Barton experts have to Google things. All right. So we're going to start by squeezing a lemon. I'm going to cut it in half. And use this handy lemon squeezer. If you don't have one of these, you can simply put a fork and break the cells of the lemon that way. Um, and we're going to go for one ounce. So I'm going to pour it directly into the jigger. If you have one of these, this is great. Other measuring devices are fine. Um, this is one ounce on this side. So I'm going to put it directly in there. So I'm not sure that you get to see this, but honestly, the act of squeezing this is not complicated. Um, out of a lemon, one lemon, you can get anywhere between three quarters to one and a half ounces of liquid. Obviously, there may be some mutant lemons out there too, so I don't want to discount that. But I would say generally expect to get an ounce to an ounce and a half. So we got that in there. Um, lemon syrup, I'm going to put in one ounce of that too. Now, this is a temperance drink. It doesn't have any alcohol in it, but it was famous in its day for being absolutely delicious, and it is delicious. For those of you who are like, but I want a drink. I want a drink of alcohol. You certainly could spike this if you wish. I would say vodka, gin are good choices. You don't have to. It's balanced on its own, but it really wouldn't be bad with a shot of gin in there as well. So I'm going to take an egg, and this scares people. Eggs are scary, less like acid phosphate. I guess I'm just introducing like very scary ingredients today, but it's perfectly safe um, as long as you don't have a, a compromised immune system or young or old. That's what they say usually in terms of raw ingredients. Um, and I put one egg white in there and I am going to do a dash of the acid phosphate, just a little bit. Usually a dash is about eight drops. So let's throw two more in there. All right. So notice I haven't put in any ice yet because with cocktails and non-alcoholic cocktails, you want to build the glass, you want to build it in the shaker first and then add the ice because as soon as you add the ice, it starts the process of basically cooking. Just like if you put a souffle in the oven, you can't take it out again and crack an egg and put it in there. So that's why I do it that way. Um, and so I'm going to grab, and as far as ice, fill it up all the way to the top. It doesn't really matter what ice you have at home. Some people have the fancy, you know, ice. It's a one and a quarter inches like we have. We are a fancy bar. Of course we have that. Um, some people have the moon shaped ice and the, the white molds. That's what I have at my house. It's okay. Um, that'll work too. And when I shake, if you started shaking it, stop. Everybody's shaking stuff. I can't see you, but I know how ridiculous some people look shaking. I apologize in advance. They do this kind of measuring, and then there's like the cool bartender one like this. But what you really want to do is put it about chest height back and forth with equal sort of force and just. We're going to do that for about 15 seconds. Now, for those of you who like it extra frothy, I do, um, we're then going to pour it out again, no ice, 
all of it. Make sure you get every little foamy bit. And we're going to shake it again without ice. Now I know this is kind of complicating things a little bit. So I'll give everyone a chance to go to the sink, dump whatever they have to. So this is just the ingredients that have been shaken with ice without ice. It's called a double, uh, I'm sorry, it's called a dry shake. And this makes sure to get it nice and frothy. When I pour it into the glass, you're gonna see right off the bat, it's just really frothy, right? We're going to add, and this is sort of like what the drink is about. It's supposed to be like really refreshing and um, definitely have this sort of plume of uh, froth on top. I'm gonna to add some ice, just enough to get it to the top. And honestly, I probably should add a little bit more of the soda water that I'm going to. I went a little crazy with the ice, it's okay. We're gonna add a couple ounces of soda water, but I might not have that much. And you want it to go all the way over the top. You see that? It looks beautiful like that. It's like a commercial. Yeah. And this is Thompson's Spa Phosphate. So Derek, I think I have to tell you that I, uh, I did cheat earlier in the week and I, I did a little test drive. And mm -hmm. uh, I have learned something here because I put my ice in first and, oh. uh, and then obviously made a huge error. So uh, I think I will take another run at this, make it more frothy. Got it. You, yeah, do it. Because that, I think that's part of what like, makes it so attractive. It's nice and frothy and it's got a deep, rich, lemony flavor. And the acid phosphate is just, it's a, a, essentially acidulant. So it adds a little bit more of the tartness that you get out of citrus without adding flavor. So it's a really nice um, ingredient. Now I'm going to start sipping this. And I think I'll tell you a little bit about temperance and prohibition. Great. I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you the full screen and I think I'm going to try, I'm starting to get a little thirsty. It is Friday. It's happy hour. I'm going to maybe uh, try and give myself another uh, run at this. Let me see how I do. Good. Gin or no gin? No, Jen. This is I'm, I'm sticking with the program. All right, still working. I got it. Okay. All right. Well, everybody, thank you um, for me running, uh, listening to me while I run through that really quickly. I know that was a very quick um, demo, and certainly, if you have questions about that, we can get to it later. Put them in the chat, no problem. I want to talk a little bit about prohibition. Um, prohibition. I think for many, especially if you're a bartender or you're a drinker, right off the bat, it sounds as scary as raw eggs and acid phosphate, right? It seems like an evil part of history where uh, they took something from us that we, you know, is our God-given right to have alcohol. And um, how could they do that, one? And, and certainly that's something that we should frown upon and look down on. Now, I do think we should. Honestly, prohibition was a terrible idea. And it led to really so many unknown consequences, least of which was a growth of a criminal underground. And the fact that almost all Americans who drank kept drinking in some capacity and became a nation of scofflaws, which is a word, scofflaw, specifically invented during prohibition to describe somebody who scoffed at the law. One week later, a Parisian bartender created a cocktail called the scofflaw cocktail. So you can imagine how successful that word was and how successful prohibition was in general. But what I do want to say is good about prohibition. I know that probably sounds really weird, a bartender saying that, but what was good about it is the movement that preceded it was called the temperance movement. Now the temperance movement was a religious movement. And in that way, I think that it was tied to a specific ideology. Um, especially when we talk about the WCTU, the Women Christian, uh, Christian Temperance Movement, um, and, and, and all of the religious organizations that were behind temperance. Those took it to a level that was completely you know, different. That became this legislative uh, sort of um, act that they were seeking to ban alcohol. Um, obviously, what they did instead was pass an amendment that banned the sale and transportation of alcohol, a little different than banning alcohol itself. Um, and uh, and that, I think, took it to a new level. But before that, there were plenty of people who were right to advocate for temperance. 
You see, Americans have always probably drank too much. That's just the reality. When we look back on the colonial days in America, and this was part of the Spirit Republic exhibit, which was uh, years and years ago, that is how I got connected to the archives in the first place, um, where I became the chief spirits advisor. They, um, they, they uh, literally talked about the fact that every um, person in colonial America consumed about 7.1 gallons of pure alcohol. Now, obviously, they were drinking that in beer and various substances, sherry and so on. But um, in terms of the volume, it was seven gallons, over seven gallons per year per person, which is an outrageous amount of alcohol. So, so much that today we probably do, I don't know, a little over two gallons of uh, alcohol per person. And that in itself is probably a lot of drinking. Obviously the pandemic itself is a whole other issue about how we dealt with that. It was a difficult, how, we, how we're dealing with it is a difficult time. Um, so there was some logic to temperance and even you know very famous people in the past politicians like Abraham Lincoln, were advocates, although certainly they were playing a political role where they had to kind of speak to both sides. But Abraham Lincoln, in his famous speech where he talked about our better angels, which is a, a, a phrase that has been used over and over again in this contentious political environment, um, came from a speech about temperance, where he said the legislative um, part of it may not be sound, but the moral part of it to, uh, you know, uh, encourage people to to be temperate, uh, to to not dr over drink, to not drink too much was a good idea. So this idea of temperance, let's separate that from prohibition and say that wasn't really all that bad. It was the legislative agenda that caused so many problems. But the idea of saying to somebody, hey, as Americans, we're drinking too much. We need to slow down. We need to take care of ourselves. We need to take care of each other is not at all a bad thing. And there was lots of groups, even sort of these proto-alcoholics anonymous groups that existed um, that were advocating for that. And not always the abstinence of alcohol, sometimes just take it easy, don't do it too much, which I think is a good idea. And so out of this came these temperance groups and they, they were uh, throughout the United States and they were out throughout Europe as well. They're especially successful in England. Um, and there they even set up these non-alcoholic bars, right? which seems crazy, but there were pubs that had drinks like this. Not this one, because it was invented by another non-alcoholic bar we'll talk about in a second. But they had these bars where you could go and you could have a great drink, you could have a great atmosphere, interact with people, and still remain temperate. And, and so I think that, that that was a wonderful idea, having choice, right? That's what it's about. And so that idea carried to America in terms of the non-alcoholic bars or temperance bars, and in the, uh, late 19th century, before Prohibition, there was a bar that opened, which was called Thompson Spa in Boston. So Thompson Spa was named Spa after the town in Belgium, Belgium, which was famous for its mineral waters. And those mineral waters became famous in the United States too, in terms of Saratoga Springs. And they were something that were, was health giving. There was something that were good for you. And if that seems crazy that water could be good for you, don't get me started on vitamin water and, and the various potions that we believe will change our lives um, in a can. Um, but but certainly minerals, trace minerals and so forth, do have some effect. I'm not I'm a bartender, not a doctor, so I won't claim the validity of that. But I will say that they do something, and and so they were part of this idea of the spa. And so uh, the very smart person who opened it, Charles Sumner Eaton, no relationship to Charles Sumner, the senator. Um, was uh, you know a, a an engineer? He was a very scientifically minded person, but he was also a businessman. So he decided he was going to open up this place called Thompson Spa, using that identity, and it was a temperance bar. He was a very, like I said, engineering kind of uh, type person, and he created all of these soda fountain type elements to it. Uh, none of the drinks used ice; they were all cooled from internal. Um, sort of mechanisms that that he would never even share how it was done um, because they were proprietary. Um, but at the same time, the soda fountain was becoming very popular in the United States. And the soda fountain was a way that they could um, uh, actually uh, have great drinks that were non-alcoholic, although some of those drinks in, included 
other substances, which are now perhaps illegal, um, those, uh, you know, it provided a whole different kind of perspective. You know, cocktail, a couple of them will slow you down. Um, there's certainly not energy giving it uh, after a point because alcohol itself is biphasic. Um, but something with caffeine in it, something with other ingredients would certainly be lifting. So Soda Fountain started to flourish. He saw that too. He put it in Thompson Spa and it became a very famous temperance bar that did well because some of the other temperance bars in the U.S., which were religiously dominated, were not quite as fun. Perhaps morally correct in terms of the environment and the fun to be had, it wasn't there. So, so his was a different place. And it became so famous that um, it also started serving lunch. It became at one point the, known as the uh, most famous lunch counter in the world. Um, and it was you know, in movies, it was in books, uh, and it was celebrated as this great lunch counter place with wonderful drinks, none of which were alcoholic. Um, it expanded into 12 different restaurants. And then later um, in the 1950s, uh, died a slow death long after Eaton had passed away. And uh, that was the end of it. But, but when I found this recipe, I became fascinated by the whole history of it. Now, the reason I became fascinated, we're not long before we get into the question and answer, but I do want to add this, is because we have a sort of temperance movement today. It's very different than the temperance movement in the past in the sense that it is not necessarily tied to a religious group. Um, and it is you know, called many different things, sort of sober curious, mindful drinking. Um, and all of it has to do with this idea that we can make great drinks. We can have wonderful experiences without alcohol. Alcohol is not necessary. It's not to say that alcohol can't be there or that we can't use it in moderation. It's to say that we should be open to choice. And so I've really glommed onto that and love that idea. And, and, and I've been inspired by a lot of people who are creating temperance bars all over again, such as the getaway in uh, New York uh, or Listen Bar um, and, or um, Sands Bar in, in um, Texas. And so all of these different bars have been sprouting up by people like Chris Marshall um, and uh, they've created this new culture around it where we can enjoy ourselves, we can have fun. Um, we can even have wonderfully crafted drinks, but alcohol is a choice. We can do it, but we can't. And I think that's really wonderful. I think that that's what it's all about. And so my book, Mindful Mixology, also talks about that, drawing from a lot of temperance drinks, um, but also creating some new drinks using techniques from modern mixology as well as the past. So I really love that. I hope you enjoy this drink. If you didn't have the acid phosphate and you didn't get your foam right, Patrick, then it's okay. Keep working on it. Mixology is something that um, you, you get better at over time if you practice, just like anything else. Um, it's not hard in terms of the entry, but it is hard to make great drinks. Otherwise, I guess we wouldn't be here. That's it. That's, that was terrific. So I did a little better job. For the record, when I sat back down, the foam was cresting and oh. kept talking. So I, it, it slowly went down, but uh, definitely a different uh, vibe putting the, uh, the ice in second and the double shake. I did not shake it the second time uh, my first go around. So Foaming. all these it's little sort of tricks. Kind of zingy, right? When you taste it, it should like liven your, your tongue and you know, make you more excited and energetic. Yeah, well, this has been great. Um, we're starting to get some questions in, so please uh, throw your questions into the chat. Um, want to remind folks uh, to do that. Before we jump into the questions, I uh, want to welcome all the folks. we got folks from all over the DC area. I know you well, Derek. Uh, we've got some folks from Frisco, Texas, some other spots in Texas, San Francisco, Mississippi, Connecticut, Wisconsin, uh, sunny Southern California. I think they're rubbing it in a little bit there. Uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, North Dakota, Wyoming, Pennsylvania. That was a twist. Um, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Seattle. We've got the country. You've got the country covered here. Great. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, hello. <laughs> I hope everyone's okay in Texas. Exactly. Exactly. It's been a tough, tough week. Um, so first question, going back to the recipe, um, and this might've been someone, I believe we put the recipe on our website. Uh, now, I know we sent it out to folks in case they did want to make it with you. Um, what should the quantity be if you use aquafaba? Ah, great. That's a great question. I'm sorry I should have brought that up. So, so aquafaba is chickpea water. 
right? For those of you who don't know. And, and, and it's exactly where you think it comes from, from a can of chickpeas. And it is something that uh, plant-based vegan bakers have used for a long time in place of eggs. It works wonderfully. And so Barton is starting to adopt it because it works in place of eggs, but it also is very stable. So it works to do foam, to make foams just like um, egg whites. This one originally was of an egg, but you could certainly replace about a half ounce of chickpea water and it would do just fine. Okay, and then how much, uh, uh, how many ounces are in an egg white? Uh, so that can vary. We usually say a small egg white, right? Because eggs vary in size. You've seen crazy, not ostrich eggs, but you've seen eggs that maybe, maybe there's some kind of uh, chemical support for them. Um, or, uh, but, but, but honestly, you want to use a smaller one and it's about the same. It can go anywhere from, from a half ounce to an ounce. Okay. We've had a couple comments um, about the colonial period and uh, mm -hmm. I might not have caught everything you said because that's right when I was mixing. So um, some folks have raised the, the one of the reasons uh, they were drinking so much is because the water quality was so poor. And so I know you'll, you'll have a comment on that because also in the fall, we did a program with our friends from Mars and they talked about how in colonial times, hot chocolate was the, uh, the drink of choice uh, for medicinal reasons, but also the same issue. So do you want to talk a little bit about the water and drinking around colonial period, revolutionary period? Yeah, that's right. If you saw many people get dysentery or die from the water, you probably would skip it in flavor of beer any day. And so I think that that was one of the factors that was involved in it. Um, and so people would drink uh, small beers or little beers, which uh, were lower alcohol in some cases for, for children. Children drank this um, and, and they would drink beer all day. Um, and uh, sometimes they drank sherry. Sometimes they drank, you know, obviously ale, beer, sherry. Um, they had Madeira. Madeira, these are fortified wines that were from throughout the world. Um, wine itself was not, uh, you know, plentiful back then because American vines uh, suffered from some, some uh, root pests and um, European uh, wines didn't travel well enough um, in many cases, not in all cases. Um, and so, so fortified wines would have been bigger, beer would have been big, hot chocolate was big, some really interesting fun drink slash desserts like possets and um, and uh, uh, syllabubs. And then they had just this litany of really uh, interesting drinks back then, like rattle skulls and stone fences and mimbos and bombos and all these different, the cocktail itself doesn't come around until the late 18th century. And it doesn't, it's not mentioned in America until 1803. And so, you know, before that they had many mixed drinks to drink and enjoy. Um, and so, so uh, you know, yes, water was the, the enemy um, and alcohol was the solution. And um, so we're starting to get a couple of questions here about uh, a little bit more about the ingredients. And I know this is where you, you like to geek out a little bit. You talk a little bit about the, uh, the origin of bitters and then sort of related to that, uh, another question uh, about the flavor profile of acid phosphate in the drink, sweet, tart, so maybe you can bundle those two together. Yeah, bitters themselves are basically um, compound tinctures that involve a bittering agent, right? And so an example of a bittering agent that they would use in it are barks and peels. Um, gentian would be one thing. Wormwood would be another. Um, gentian is probably more common in, if you've seen Angostura bitters, excuse me, or orange bitters, those usually have gentian at the base of it. Um, and they come from essentially, you know, this medicine, the snake oil, if you will, that was meant to go like a cure-all. So people would put these together and say, this is good for everything. In fact, I remember looking back at this ad for Brown's Iron Bitters. Obviously, I had a, a stake in that um, as a Brown myself. And so I looked back at this old ad and it said, with the addition of iron, not, not the best idea, but but um, it said in it that it cures all these different ailments and it just listed about 30 of them. Um, if you went down, you saw that one would say that it cures constipation, good. 
glad it helps that. And you went down further and it said that it would cure diarrhea. Now, what was interesting about that is I thought, how does it know which one and how to do that? So otherwise it could be a tremendous disaster for the person involved. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that there were a lot of outrageous claims about what bitters did. And fortunately in 1906, I think it was 1906, if anybody else out there knows for sure, please correct me, the Pure Food and Drug Act came in and it started to regulate some of these outlandish claims that uh, medicines, including bitters, would make. So that's where they come from. But what do they do is that they change the flavor of the cocktail a lot like salt and pepper to a steak or to, to meat in general. It, you know, you have a flavor like lemon, you have a flavor like, or, or just the flavor profile of whiskey, um, and those are great in themselves. You add a little bitters and it lights up all of the flavor components. They have um, herbs and spices in them. They have bittering agents, roots, barks, and um, spices in it. And it's just all around a good thing. I've even added Angostura bitters to my eggs and it's awesome. So, so they're good for flavoring uh, a drink. Um, acid phosphate is another camp. It is, as I mentioned, an acidulant, which means that it adds a tartness or acid um, to, in this case, it uh, uh, is literally acid phosphate. It doesn't taste like much. Um, it's a way to add that tartness without adding flavor. Um, so much like citric acid or other types of acid that are common in our food stuff, um, it, it adds the bite or the tartness without adding um, lemon, orange, et cetera. And, and, uh, and I did look up, so uh, when I went to say, oh, I've got to go out and get this, and I found out it was not very easy to get a hold of, I did Google, like, oh, I'll, I'll just make some on my own. And it became very clear, uh, I did, my, my chemistry from high school is not going to suit me well for this. So uh, I, I did skip that that step. So I look forward to uh, adding that to this, this recipe. So we are getting a few more questions on, on a little bit more on the, um, on the actual ingredients here. Can you uh, make your own um, chickpea juice from dry chickpeas and leave them in water overnight? Is that the same thing? So I have tried that and I have not had success with that. So I would recommend, I know it sounds, it's like antithetical to the general classic cocktail movement, which is champion fresh fruits, fresh ingredients, you know, going to farmer's market. Um, in this case, just buy that 99 cent can of, of, <laughs> of chicken water, pop it open, make some hummus, real easy to do, put in a blender, a little tahini, lemon, garlic, um, you know, salt, good to go. Excellent. And what about uh, cream of tartar uh, to replace the acid phosphate? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting about cream, cream of tartar. I've, um, I've used that and I've tried to use that in a different, couple different ways in cocktails, especially because one of the things that it does is it helps to hold foams be more stable. Um, but I haven't had a lot of success with that. And, and I don't know that it exactly fits the same profile. So, so I would say that's not something that I've used in that capacity. Um, so I don't, I, I wouldn't endorse it right now, but, but if you have had success with it, please let us know and, and let us know how much you use so I can try it. Excellent. Uh, always open to new ideas like that. Uh, so I know we're, it's a little bit off topic of this prohibition related one, but since you mentioned it, we have a question of uh, if you were going to add gin, uh, what would work best? Or what do you recommend? I think they're looking for certain brands, maybe, and the amount of gin. Yeah, you know, this one is, is pretty versatile because lemon, eggs, and um, sugar are pretty forgiving profile. Um, there's a lot of things you could put in this, and it would be fine. And essentially, you're creating something like a Tom Collins. Um, I would say that my favorite are sort of like backbone gins, like the, the British gins that are like Plymouth or Tangeray or Beefeater. Um, obviously those range in terms of their intensity, um, but all of them kind of fit this London dry gin profile. Um, but if you, you know, you wanted something that's maybe a little more floral or had other flavors and juniper is there, which is what I mean by the backbone, but it's not as prominent. You could certainly use Hendrix. That would be a great one um, to use or aviation gin, um, which has a more floral profile. Excellent. And one of our many historians who have joined us confirms 1906 was the correct Correct date. Well done. Um, <laughs> you're starting to get you're starting to get a hang of it. 
Um, what about, so there was an early question that I, I did skip over. Um, are you going to mention Lemonade Lucy? Am I going to mention, I don't, I don't know who Lemonade Lucy is, so this is a story that perhaps I could be told. Okay, well, so we'll, we'll put that on the, for your next program with us. We might have to revisit Lemonade Lucy. Our Lemonade Lucy, I love it. <laughs> um, uh, besides your own books, which you're happy to, you know, remind people uh, what they are. Do you have any favorite books that you might uh, recommend for folks who are looking at sort of the history of alcohol, uh, you know, obviously certain alcohols or drinking the, the arc? I know you, you obviously did a great one with uh, inspired by your 10 part series you did with us a few years ago, but um, so please. Yeah, I think that, um, what I like is that there's some people out there who've combined the two, um, and one of them who's the, like recipes and the history, and one of the, the, the masters of that is a guy named David Wondrich. And David Wondrich wrote a book um, called Imbibe, which talks about one person in particular named Jerry Thomas, who we refer to as a professor, who in 1862 wrote the first bartender's guide. There's recipe books that existed before that, saloon keepers before that, but this is something specific. It had 10 cocktails in it and the, the first book to feature 10 cocktails. And so this book is called Imbibe. There's a longer subtitle, I can't tell you. That's a great book. If you wanna go even farther back, if you're interested in British naval history, there's a book, he did another book called Punch. Um, and so uh, both of those books are great companions to drinking. Um, I think there's a, a, a lot of other books. An author that I like a lot is Wayne Curtis. Um, he was with us for one of our uh, seminars, um, and he he's written a, a book on rum that's awesome. Rum was a critical part of um, early uh, American drinks. I should have mentioned that as well. Um, and uh, so that one is is good. That that's going to give you a place to go if you want to learn something about the sort of like contemporary you know um, uh, drinks in terms of non-alcoholic. A great one is Good Drinks by Julia Bainbridge. Not history oriented, but has a lot of great non-alcoholic cocktails. Uh, one that's, I think, wonderful. Great. Well, I'm going to ask you a question. Every Everyone I interview hates, so you'll have to pick your favorite child. Do you have a favorite drink? I do. Um, as far as the alcohol drinks, my favorite is the dry martini. I just think it's the apogee of the classic cocktail movement. It is the most wonderful drink of all time. Um, and I sip them rarely, but they are a true treat when I have them. Um, and then as far as non-alcoholic drinks, I, uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Coca-Cola wins. It's so good. All right. I don't drink it often for the same reason. It is not great for you, but, and sorry, I don't, I forgot if Coca-Cola was a sponsor or whatever, but, um, but it is a, it is a delicious beverage and few have are as delicious. Now, obviously there's a lot in between the dry martini and the Coca-Cola. So I um, uh, invite you to, to uh, check out all these great drinks in my book in 2022. They'll have a lot of them. Excellent. So uh, just to play off of this, I have to ask you, where have you gone in the country, in the United States, and got sort of the strangest drink? Interesting. You know what? They, you wanna, <laughs> there's lots of places, there's lots of these little weird drinks that exists throughout the world, world whether or in the U.S. are like Moxie, or if you get peanuts and Coca-Cola, um, there's some strange ones out there. But but let me throw, let me let me let me say peanuts and Coca-Cola was both strange and amazing. So I don't know about how many of you have tried this before, and I apologize to the peanut uh, allergists out there. But what you do is you get a bottle of Coca-Cola, you sip it from it, and then you literally take salted peanuts and add it to it and then drink and it sounded so strange to me um and i tried it and it was pure heaven absolutely delightful but i used virginia peanuts which are the best out there there you go uh very good uh let me get to back to a couple of the questions so uh we do have again another one of our historians have helped educate you and i lemonade lucy with rutherford b hayes's wife and for oh. political, political reasons, Hayes prohibited the service of alcohol at the White House. His wife was blamed for it and derided as Lemonade Lucy. So, ah, that's right. Go. Well, here's the concern about that. So Shoemakers was DC's 
preeminent bar, um, even going so far as to be called a great bar in the congressional record, actually, um, that existed before prohibition. It turned into a soda shop for a little while after prohibition was not successful. Um, but during its time, every politician um, visited there. I mean, I'm, well, every politician, but every president, uh, except Rutherford B. Hayes, and apparently Lemonade Lucy. <laughs> Very good tie-in. And uh, of course, for those who come to visit who are in the Washington area or want to come visit when we open back our doors, the National Temperance Monument is across the street from the National Archives. So thank you, Patrick Wilson, one of our, our members for reminding us of that. Um, I know we've only got a few more minutes left. Um, I did want to uh, follow up on an early question, but then talk about what you've been up to during this very difficult time, obviously, for the the, the bar and restaurant world. First question though, um, question was about the mural behind you. Can you talk about what it is and uh, a little bit of the history? I know it's very iconic for the Columbia Room. Sure, I'm gonna start just a brief mention of the Temperance Monument because it is truly DC's ugliest mon monument, which was, was built by a, a, a dentist to try to inspire men to drink water instead of alcohol, but it has two fish that look like they're copulating in it. And I don't know what about that makes you wanna drink water, but. Um, so behind me is the uh, mural for the Columbia Room, uh, which is, I'm sorry, mural, it's a mosaic um, that was created, uh, uh, was built in Italy. And it was uh, created by a artist and myself, um, when uh, his, the artist named John DiNapoli, he's an architect and artist, and we were talking about the history of alcohol, the history of cocktails, and the history of the Columbia Room, and how they all tied in together. And I'll give you a quick um, way that works. So, so going back to all the way to um, the earliest pubs or taverns, you know, a lot of people, we're talking about the 14th century, uh, a lot of people were illiterate back then. So they would use animal icons to name it's like you've heard of like the ox and the owl or whatever and, and so the griffin was one of them you've, seen, you've probably heard bars or pubs named the griffin and so we put that there because we want people to know we are a fancy cocktail bar in 20 you know 21 but but we we go all the way back then we share the roots all the way back to alchemists and through along the way to to the many tavern owners throughout history um and so we try to embed some of the history of alcohol and cocktails in it. In fact, over here we have, it starts with Aristotle, um, who was very close to discovering distillation of alcohol. Um, and we have people like Dick Francis, who is one of DC's um, you know, best bartender, a black bartender, it's important during Black History Month, who uh, was renowned for his drinks. Um, and so we tried to embed in this, the history of DC, of drinks um, and the whole history in general. We're, we're proud to be part of a movement that started so, you know, 500,000 years ago to enjoy drinks. Excellent. Um, and I, I can't let you go. I, a couple other, first of all, I've inspired some very strange drinks pub, bubbling in on the comments. So afterwards, you'll have to look at the comments there because I'm sure you'll, you'll get a kick out of them. Um, uh, so just real quick, a couple of questions about um, uh, non-alcoholic drinks that you, I'm sure you can answer relatively quickly. Uh, for those who prefer dry cocktails, how can you keep mocktails from being too sweet, especially if you're using fruit juice? Well, this one's a great example. Um, acid phosphate helps to make it tart. It has a lot of lemon flavor up front, which would trick you into a, a little, you know, it's got sweetness, but on the back end, it is sour. And I think that's one way to do it. There's also a lot of non-alcoholic spirits that are distilled products um, that you can get that are out there that are no sugar or very low sugar. And so you can use them a lot uh, in the same way that you could use a non-alcoholic, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, alcohol spirit. So those are really cool. Um, in my book, I talk about that a lot. There's ways to balance it. There, you know, um, certainly using bitters, which suppresses sweetness. Certainly making sure you're using fresh citrus helps um, and uh, making sure you're not going overboard on the sugar to begin with. Okay. Um, so like I said, let, let, I want to talk, give you a chance to talk a little bit about, uh, we'll go back to March of last year. Everything's closing down. Uh, obviously very challenging, especially for Washington. We we're going ramping up for our tourism season. 
and everything is everyone's at home. So t- talk to us a little bit about some of the, obviously there's a lot of leadership roles you've taken in the city, uh, but you've also innovated and in, uh, over, over the course of the year. Yeah, it's, I mean, the word that everybody uses, which we're all tired of hearing, but it's too real, is pivot, right? We had to pivot quite a bit and change our program um, because food was a bigger component of what we had to serve, would be, I think, to serve our community. Um, so we switched to a sandwich shop, actually, and that sandwich shop also had a charity component to it as well, so we could help people who are less fortunate than us. Um, but, it, but we suffered a great deal. You know, I mean, overall, we lost a lot of our sales. We had to lay off some of our employees. Eventually, we were able to hire many of them back um, because of the government intervention and because of the kindness of people who continued to order drinks and, and support us. Um, but we, you know, we got away from what we do best and what we love, and we, we were turning to that, which is to serve you all. We make drinks and to create an environment where we can all enjoy ourselves and each other. You know, um, bars at the best are places where people gather and uh, create community, whether it's through spending time with your loved ones or getting to know people you've never met before. Um, bars are a healing thing. They should be a healing part of our community. And we miss that. And we hope that you all are able to come back and visit the many bars throughout the country. For those of you where bars are open, please visit us safely. For those where they're not, make sure to order carry out so that they exist after this whole thing, because there is an after, right? And we should look forward to that. Um, and so um, it's been hard, it's been a challenge. Bartenders have gone, gone through a lot um, because not only do have they lost a lot of money, they're aching to do what they do best. That energy behind the bar, that interaction with the customer. Bartenders are a unique kind of people and I, I can see them, I know them, that they are suffering much through this. So try to support them in any way you can. Um, and uh, you know, support bars in general. They are not just places where we drink. They are places that we create community. Um, the Restaurants Act is still on the table. Please support that if you can um, through the Independent Restaurant uh, Coalition. Um, and and let's get some more support for bars and restaurants so they can continue to serve. Them. Terrific. Well, Derek, uh, as always, we should double your pay as our spirits advisor. We appreciate the generosity of your time. Uh, I know those of us in the Washington area can't wait to get back to one of several of your bars and, and all the other ones in, in the city so we can, like you say, build, rebuild our, our community, enjoy the, the fun times that we, we have when we're, we're in such places. So uh, thanks for the time. There's, there's, I know there's more questions we haven't gotten to. Uh, I hope you do have a chance to check out the, the comments because I'd love to talk to you later on about some of, the, some of these drinks that are, that are bubbling up. And uh, we look forward to having you on again soon. Uh, let's not wait till the, the book comes out. We'd love to have you later in the year. Yep, let's do it. I'd love to. And thank you to the National Archives Foundation, the National Archives, and all of you, Patrick and Tineal, everybody who's continued to support me, and, and I appreciate it. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Derek. Um, and uh, as uh, just as a thank you to Derek, he's such a good friend uh, to the foundation. We want to give him a, a plug. Um, you will uh, see here, uh, he does other events uh, out of the Columbia Room. So you can go to columbiaroomdc.com and learn more about uh, what he's got going on. And um, just a t- terrific guy and a terrific uh, uh, knowledge base. And there's, there's a reason why he uh, obviously is our, our chief spirits advisor and advised uh, the archives in, in its uh, Spirited Republic exhibition a few years ago that looked at the role of government and, uh, and alcohol. Uh, so just a few closing announcements here. We wanna thank, of course, all of our members. Uh, great seeing some of the names pop up in the Q&A. Uh, our donors, our corporate council. If you're not a member of the foundation, you can join today by visiting our website, archivesfoundation.org. And uh, it's a new year, uh, but the National Archives still is one of the hottest museums to shop in, and there must be a few of you out there who haven't visited and bought something at our e-store. All the sales do support the National Archives Foundation with some cool history-related barware as well, uh, and the watch, which we'll have to get back to Derek on that. Visit nationalarchivesstore.org, and you can check out what we've got going on uh, in our e-store. And uh, we've got some more programs coming up. We've got one more this month, Uh, Don't uh, forget to join us next week for Freedom Summer, Inspiring Young Voters Today. We've got uh, the Managing Director of the Andrew Goodman Foundation, 
is going to talk about how civil, uh, civil rights murder in 1964 is inspiring a national movement of young people to vote and en engage in civic life today. He'll be joined with a representative from Tufts University who will talk about trends in youth voting and student voting. And we'll also have a student from the University of Wisconsin who's going to share what it was like to organize campus voting during the pandemic last fall. So I hope you'll join us next week for that. That's going to be a, a fantastic conversation. And then in March, we've got a couple of programs coming up. We're going to continue our presidential library series with the Truman Library. They have some exciting things going on there with a major renovation in the works. So you want to learn a little bit of history and a little bit of what's going on at the Truman Library. And then uh, later in March, uh, we will be having a conversation about the First Ladies who risked their lives for the civil rights movement. And that will, uh, I should say, for civil rights, because we'll be going from from Martha Washington all the way to Michelle uh, Obama. And uh, that'll feature uh, Diana Carlin, Anita McBride, and Nancy Keegan Smith uh, as they look at the history of First Ladies and civil rights um, over time. So uh, another great one. So put that on your calendar and don't forget to register. Uh, you can uh, follow us on social media or sign up for our emails if, uh, if you wanna stay tuned in to all the things the foundation has going on. Remember the National Archives is our nation's memory. What is past is prologue. Until next time, on behalf of the National Archives Foundation, thank you for joining us today.